let's just say also that as Kirill said in the emails, in two weeks from now, John will be going to us. Okay? No, let's start. Okay, thanks Thomas. Yeah, okay, as Thomas said, I'm here in Nottingham since more or less a year, or a bit more than a year. And uh, yeah, my, my research is, I would say, mostly on mathematics inspired by physics. And in particular, I'm interested in a quantum gauge series and their interplay with homotopy theory. And so what I will do today is I will give you a broad overview of what I'm doing. And in particular, give you the physical motivations and a bit of a, a, a bit of a view on the mathematical techniques we are using. So more in detail, what I will do is, um, <coughs> so I will first of all tell you a bit about the framework for doing quantum field theory mathematically precise, and this is algebraic quantum field theory, or its generalization to Lorentzian manifolds called locally covariant quantum field theory. And then after I tell you a bit about this framework, I will say why it is insufficient to describe quantum gauge series. Then in the next step I will show you some ideas and observations which leads me to believe that the way how to solve this problem is to combine these approaches to quantum field series, so locally covering quantum field series for example, with more modern mathematics which is called homotopical algebra or higher category theory or homotopy theory. Um, in order to arrive at something more flexible which is able to describe gauge series. And then if I have time at the end, probably not too much, I will tell you a bit about the results we obtained. So this is a long-term research project we are working on. Um, and I will tell you a few of the results we obtained and tell you what is the state of the art of the developments we are doing. Okay, now locally covariant quantum field theory versus gauge theory. So, um, let me briefly, so I don't expect that many of you are familiar with algebraic quantum field theory, but let me give you a basic idea of what we are doing. So it's a very basic approach, I would say. We are doing just minimalistic things. So when you want to describe quantum field series, what you need definitely is non-commutative algebras. This describes quantum observables. But then what is different between quantum mechanics and quantum field theory is that space-time plays a role. So quantum field theory is kind of on the interplay between quantum observables and space-times. And the basic idea how to formulate a quantum field theory in an axiomatic framework goes back to Brunetti, Friedman and Fag in this, in this kind of variant I'm telling you now. And the basic idea is quite simple. So you have a space-time and what you want to do, what the quantum field theory should do, it should assign an algebra to that space-time, namely the things you can measure in this space-time. But now you don't know on which space-time you live, so you have to take all possible space-times into account. This is here log, the category of space-times. And for each of these space-times I want to assign an algebra, but not in a random way, but in a compatible way, in the sense that when I have an embedding of a small space-time into a big one, I want to have a map mapping the observables I can measure in M to the observables I can measure in the big space-time. So this then should be an algebra map. And this of course should be, when I do that twice, I go from a small to a medium to a big space-time, then it shouldn't matter in which way I'm doing that if I, if I compose first the space-time maps and then look at the algebra map or vice versa. Um, and this just tells you that what we are dealing with is a functor from a category of space-times to a category of algebras. But now, not all functors will be reasonable quantum field series. You have some physical expectations what they should do. For example, now imagine you have a big space-time and a small space-time and the small one sits in the big one. Now, the observables I can measure here should of course be also be measurable on the big space-time. So all these maps between the algebras should be injective maps. So I don't want to lose observables by making my lab a bit bigger. When I make my lab bigger, I want to have more observables, not less. So all these maps should be injective maps. Now, coming from relativity, you also know that nothing should move faster than the speed of light. So, and this has the effect that when I have observables which are space-like disjoint in space-like disjoint regions, then they should commute. And the way how to formalize that in these languages, you have two small space-times embedding into a big one, but that the images are causally disjoint. So there are no causal curves from red to green or vice versa. 
and then these algebras associated to the small space time should commute as sitting inside the big algebra. So that's also very reasonable. And then at the end you want to have something like a time evolution. So you want to be able to evolve observables in time and this can be also formalized very easily. So you have a small space time embedding into a big one but not randomly but in a special way that the Cauchy surface of the big one um, that the image contains the Cauchy surface of the big one. Now you can imagine when I have some dynamic law then knowing stuff in the green region I can propagate it to the blue region and on the level of observables this means that to such maps I want to assign isomorphisms of algebras so in order to do the time evolution. Okay? So this is a very minimalistic approach to quantum field theory and so the, to say it again, so the aim is when you want to describe a quantum field theory one has to set up such a functor checking that it satisfies the physical conditions you want. Okay, now in this early works people didn't much think about local to global properties. I will tell you more a bit, a bit more about local to global properties now. Um, because I don't know, I don't know why they didn't. But when you are coming from mathematics and you have a, uh, the kind of the desire that you have local stuff and you want to glue it to obtain global stuff. So what one would like to have, or what I would like to have, is a local to global property in quantum field theory which loosely speaking should be formulated like that. So I want to recover for every space time the global algebra, so the algebra of observables on the full space time, by patching together the algebras corresponding to suitable small regions. So, for example, you have a space-time, a complicated one with hole or whatever. So this is a hole and now I want to know the algebra on this space-time and how I want to be able to recover it is by using some kind of small patches, U, V and so on, in order to determine it from local to global, yeah? Uh, I have a question. Is there any, or what is the simplest example of quantum field theory? Uh, satisfies uh, free, uh, free quantum field series, so non-indacting and perturbatively indacting. So perturb all perturbatively indacting scalar series or Dirac series satisfy that. This is a, a statement by uh, Friedenhagen and Kascha Reitzner. They, they made a construction which produces these things. Yeah. And ah, this I forgot to say. So from a practical perspective, so you might ask why, why using such a complicated language. But to deal with perturbation theory on curved spacetimes in a consistent way, you, you, you cannot do it naively. D using this language you have very nice results. For example, when you do it naively on a curved spacetime without symmetry, you have, have to add counter terms depending on the arbitrary functions. There's no reasons why these counter terms should be constant. But using this principle here, you can prove that the counter terms have to be determined locally from the metric and hence the renormalization goes much better than doing it in a, in a random ad hoc way on a fixed spacetime. So this perspective is practically very useful to do perturbative constructions and these are the typical examples. Free quantum field series we know how to construct and perturbative quantum field series. And non-perturbative ones of course nobody can construct so it's not only us. Okay, now this local to global property I was speaking about, so we want to kind of recover the global algebra from just looking at many small algebras. And there are of course different ways how you might try to formalize that. And the most obvious one would be to say, yeah, hmm, I have a functor, so I can demand it to be a so-called co-sheaf. A co-sheaf is the dual thing of what you might know, a sheaf. And this is a very coherent way of gluing local data to global data. But now the issue with that is that when you look at examples, especially the free quantum field series, you see that you don't have this co-sheaf property. Gluing as in a co-sheaf is not doing the job. Examples show that this just works for extremely special covers, like you take a manifold and you take all contractible opens in it. And then... Ah, okay. When you, the co sheaf is the following. So when you have, say, a functor like here, then you might want to do the following. Take a space time and take some cover. Yeah, some open cover. Now, you might want to look at the algebras corresponding to these regions. 
and you take all of them. So this is the co-product of Alfred. Using all of them and now you do some double counting in the overlaps. So you say, okay, now I have also algebras related to overlap regions and they map into here. Yeah? Simply from, because uij can be embedded in ui and in uj, I get at the end two maps. And the co-sheaf is when I take this data and I patch it together in a coherent way, this is called the co-limit. I, I didn't want to go into the details. Then what you get is the global algebra up to isomorphism. So this tells you that you can, using an arbitrary cover, you can recover the global algebra from this kind of gluing prescription. Okay? Um, and now the statement here is that um, when you want to realize that in examples and you compute this thing for say the free scalar field, then you see that this doesn't happen unless the cover is extremely special. We cannot characterize now extremely special, but the typical covers we would like to have, like take as a hypersurface some circle and take the three intervals, this doesn't work. You have to take much, much finer covers in order to do that. So this is a very restrictive condition, which I, which I think one shouldn't follow. I have, I have other options. So this was just the first most obvious option. So the second option, which is some property which was analyzed by Chris Fuster, is, is a, it's a different kind of local to global property. Again, here there's a strange symbol, but what, is, what does that symbol mean? So I take a suitable cover, for example, here now really a cover by kind of ni ca nice causal subspaces, yeah, so causally compatible subspaces, and then I take again the algebras in this cover, but now instead of doing that, I'm, I'm looking at these algebras as subalgebras of AM, and I generate, and I generate the algebra I get from all these small algebras. Yeah? And this people call additivity. So this is something which was studied by Chris Fuster. Um, here this is a quite nice local to global property because it is true in examples. But it is also not sufficiently good for me because the way how this generating happens, so you generate the algebra by that, you have to know the AM and the AU alpha in order to do that. It's not sufficient to know the AU alpha and want to recover AM from that. You have to know everybody and then you can check if this holds true, but you cannot define AM from this formula. So this is kind of the issue of that. Now, in my opinion, the best way, so why I'm going through that is because this will play an important role in what I will say later on. So the best way, in my opinion, how to go local to global in quantum field theory is a construction which is uh, due to Klaus Fredenhagen. So <coughs> Klaus said the following. He said now, imagine you have a space-time, a strange one with hole or whatever. Now you look at all nice regions in that space-time. By nice regions I mean open, causally compatible, so, so these are regions where light doesn't go out and in again, and diffeomorphic to Rn, so nice, uh, say, diamond regions in this space-time. So I look at all these diamond regions in that space-time, and of course they can overlap, and then overlaps can sit in bigger diamonds, so it's many, many, many regions here. And Klaus said, yeah, let's do the following. Let's take the theory on these regions and then generate, in a more clever way, an algebra which includes all of them. Um, this is called Friedenhans Universal Algebra Construction. It's an, again a different gen generating than the things I did here. Um, this is a, I didn't want to go into this detail. So this is a third way of how to go local to global, which kind of is based on taking a space-time and exhausting it um, with nice diamond regions. And this works nice. Um, I have a oh, question. Yeah? Why do you want this local to global property if it seems so hard? 
Ah, I want that because of the following question. So now um, it is much easier to construct a quantum field theory on topologically trivial space times, especially when you deal with gauge theories, then all these instantons and all this stuff which, which can happen once you have a non-trivial space time manifold. Now, when I have a local to global property very nicely under control, then I reduce the problem of constructing a quantum field theory on all space times to constructing it on nice space times, say on diamonds. And the rest is then done by machinery. This is why I want that. Especially in gauge theory, it's much easier to do that. But also in, in, other, ga in other quantum field theories, you, you, when you do, for example, renormalization, you might ask if the renormalization constants are allowed to depend on topological data, like spin structure, like, like churn classes of your bundles, or whatever is around. And, and so... Renormalization is about UV properties. It's all local. There's absolutely nothing local to the normalization, so I don't see this global. Um, but but um, it is, yeah, it should be local, and this is why I'm saying that the, in order to implement what you tell me that renormalization has to be local, um, one needs the local to global property. Because then, when I want to renormalize a theory on a fixed manifold, I do it by renormalizing it in small diamonds and then patching the renormalized stuff together. So this renormalization is always local by when you renormalize, you see that divergences are local or subtractable. Ah, but when you try to phrase that in, 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 in this algebraic framework, it's not so easy to split off the local and global aspects. When you, yes, when you do say some. some some Feynman diagrams, it, I agree with that, but, but when you want to put that things together in such a quantum field theory of this type I'm speaking, it's not so easy to separate that off. And in order to have a clear separation, in my opinion, the best way to do it is to, to understand the local to global property, renormalize the theory in small diamonds, and then induce the full guy by knowing how to go local to global. It's not clear you'll get all quantum field theories like this. I mean, there might be some that depend on global data and you just can't get it by Yes, um, but but um, all the theories which classically are ruled by stacks, um, you will get. Yeah. So I of course you can have stuff which doesn't glue. Um, yes, yeah, so supposing you have Dirac fermions that do depend on spin structure. How, how is that going to appear? In ah, yeah, but then you have. I, I tell you that later. This goes too far now. So you can recover different spin structures by going not in this in this way local to global, but in a in a higher categorical fashion. Then you produce the spin structures as part of the local data. Does does this machinery allow you to to discuss instantons and solitons and so on, or are they filtered out by construction? No, no. They 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 should appear. They, when I they they. I, I will come back to, I will later show you when I come so far, an example how to recover monopoles in, in U1 gauge theory from local data which does know about monopoles. So this works, but one needs a bit more, this is then the homotopy part of the machinery which I'm addressing later. So these things you can see locally, but it's because locally you have a lot of, I come to that, okay? So here, um, yeah, I, I, I have to, so these slides, I didn't want to discuss everything written on them because these are old slides which I used for another talk. So um, this is now a bit technical, it, it just uh, tells you that if you have a theory satisfying this condition, then it's already sp uniquely specified by its um, value on contractible space times or on simple space times. And the way how you go from here to here is by something which is called Kahn extension. I don't want to discuss these details. And the nice thing is that this, Universal algebra universality condition holds true in examples. So, in my opinion, this is the strongest candidate for a reasonable local to global property in quantum field theory. Um, and this is the one which I will focus on later on. Okay, now, so I told you already that scalar fields, Dirac fields, free and interacting, perturbative interacting, and so on, fit in that framework. And how I started with these things is that I asked the question, does gauge theory, a simple kind of gauge theory, you won Young Mills, so ma electromagnetism. Does this fit into that framework? And so what one has to do is, of course, one has to provide a construction of a functor, so of a theory, um, which one would like to interpret as, as U1 Young Mills theory. So um, the fields of interest in U1 Young Mills theory are, so you have to deal with U1 bundles, and with connections on them. So these are the gauge fields, but the gauge fields need some kind of 
bundle on which they can live, so I have to take everything into account. I have to take all U1 bundles over M with all connections on them. So this is then the space of fields, and then in a gauge theory you would then quotient out the gauge transformations and then this is the kind of gauge orbit space of the model I'm interested in. This gauge orbit space has a nice algebraic description by something called a differential cohomology group but I won't go into that detail. So this is simply the, the group of these guys. Yeah? Okay, now you just, when you want to study this theory, one also wants to study a kind of dynamic, so one wants to study the relevant equation of motion. And this equation of motion here, of course, very simple. You have a curvature, so the field strength of your guy here, and then you take the co-differential, and this is then nothing else but a billion Young Mills or Maxwell equation. And this Fm is then the space of solutions, the space of fields for the model I'm interested in. And so as a side remark, this is not just, so from construction this is an abelian group, but um, you see that this is also topologically very nice. It is, <laughs> it is an infinite dimensional abelian group, namely a Frischeli group, and, and it carries a natural pre-symplectic structure, which is the structure I want to quantize along. So here I'm now having a kind of phase space. Yeah? I'm having an infinite dimensional phase space and what we did is we tried to quantize this infinite dimensional space. Because you can add solutions? Yes, um, you, you can take your one bundles and you tensor them. There's a tensoring operation on them. You want, in principle, your one bundles are the same as, as line bundles, complex line bundles. And when you tensor line bundles, you get out line bundles. So tensoring line bundles and adding connections provides the abelian structure here. Okay? And yeah, this abelian is very important because now when the phase space is abelian, there are natural functions on it, namely exponential functions, and these are the ones we want to quantize. And now if you do that, then you prove that quantizing what is called the smooth Pondriagin tool, which is essentially the group of exponential functions on that guy here, you obtain one of these functors which satisfies half of the axioms, namely causality, so nothing goes faster than the speed of light holds true, time slice holds true, so the theory has a good time evolution, but this isotony, which was the statement that, that embedding something small into something big is, is uh, injective, this is vi violated and the local to global properties of any kind which I discussed before also violated. So this is uh, the statement. So if you want to dis uh, con uh, construct this you want Young Mill theory in that framework you run into problems because you produce something which satisfies just half of the axioms. That's not just why, because... Why, why are these properties violated? Next slide. Another question, are you sure that this was the right quantization? Other people tried other quantizations um, based on, on forgetting a few data, just using A fields, so gauge potentials or field strength fields, and they end up with the same thing. So there is a standard quantization, fork space quantization. Also. No, this is, this is deformation quantization, CCR algebra. So, so we are not talking about Hilbert spaces here. We, we, are, we, are, doing, we are doing. So, are you doing the right quantization? Yeah, sure. Course? Uh, I, they, why this is violated has a, has a reason, well, both of them, and I explain you the reason and then you will say, aha. It's, it's obvious that these things have to be violated. So you know, that's the question. There's a quantization that we know works in nature, four dots. Yeah, and this, and this quantization is, and this quantization is, is can, canonical commutation relation quantization, canonical quantization. And this is a canonical quantization which people typically do for People typically do that for symplectic vector spaces, and the same construction applies to to, to a billion groups carrying is a pre. The same yes, yes, yes. It's, it's yes, yes, yes. So it is the same quantization. Um, yes, the same as canonical quantization. Exactly. But again, this this um, I give you the reason why these are violated, and when you do your quantization, you will also see that. Um, so, <coughs> so why are these problems appearing? And the first problem about this that I don't have injective maps or I lose observables when I go from, from a space-time to another one when I do embeddings, this, is, this has a physical reason. Namely, this is related to the topological charges you have in, in gauge theory. So, in your one gauge theory you can be in the following situation. So, um, you have a space-time, and in this space-time is some hole. Yeah? Example, um, 
when you want to see the hole exactly, then take here R4, take here a point, and remove the light cone of this point. Then you have something which has a hole because this space time is diffeomorphic to R2 times S2. And S2, the sphere has kind of a hole in the sense, which I'm a hole in the sense that that these um, second the Ram com the, the second cohomology groups and the m minus second, which here is again the second cohomology group, are non-trivial. So what happens is that in these holes you can have topological charges, which in your one gauge theory are magnetic and electric fluxes. Yeah, electric and magnetic fluxes can sit in these holes, but now you find embeddings of space-times which close the hole. Here, by this example is very clear. Here I take a space-time where I cut out the region and then of course it embeds in the Minkowski space-time. And now these embeddings closing the holes kill the observables here which measure these topological charges. So here you have observables which measure magnetic and electric fluxes. Here you don't. So all these observables are mapped to zero. And this is where this violation of isotony, violation of injectivity of these maps comes from. Topological observables are not preserved under space-time embeddings. You can close holes, okay? The other one is more subtle. Why does this local to global property not hold true? And this has to do with the fact that this construction we did is based on gauge invariant observables. So let, here we took the quotient, so the functions we take on that are gauge invariant observables. And let me give you a simple illustration what goes wrong when you take gauge invariant observables. Imagine you are looking at gauge fields on the circle. You know that on the circle, the gauge orbit space is just u1, because the degrees of freedom you have is holonomy once around the circle, and this is a phase factor. Now you want to cover this circle by intervals in a certain way. It doesn't matter how you do it, but each interval has a trivial gauge orbit space because on the interval, each U1 connection is equivalent to the trivial one. So, you see that here, globally, you have a phase as a degree of freedom. Locally, in the intervals, you have no degrees of freedom. And so, how can you recover from this? That doesn't work. Yeah? So, here there is locally no degree of freedom. I cannot recover the value of this thing on the circle. So, summing up what I told you here, that this isotony violation is a physical feature, one has to accept that. Topological observables in quantum field theory behave non-injective. You can have maps killing topological observables. But, the violation of the local to global property is, I claim, and I explain later in more detail, is an artifact of taking gauge invariant observables. And so, maybe loosening up a bit on taking gauge invariant observables, one can improve on that. Yeah? So this is now what I'm trying to do. I'll show you how to loosen up on gauge invariant observables in a controlled way and how this improves these local to global aspects. And violation of isotony I accept because this is physics. Okay, now loosening up gauge orbit spaces. Um, so let's Let's do it very slow. So we, we do uh, we take a, si a very simple say Minkowski space-time m r m is equal to r to the power m. So on this very simple space-time, you know how to do gauge theory at least classically. You know that in gauge theory you speak about gauge fields, which are Lie algebra valued one forms, and you speak about gauge transformations, which are Lie group valued so structure group valued functions transforming the gauge potentials like that in the standard way. Now, typically people, people tre uh, yeah, I don't know why, but, but it's probably because how we do mathematics education, people immediately start quotienting. Yeah? When I give you a space and a group, 95% of the people quotient because they learn when I have a space and a group, I look at the quotient. But this is not what one should do here. This, I did it on the last slide. And this was wrong, because it's much, you can do something much more clever than forming a quotient. Namely, you take the space and the group and you encode it in a, in a better, more flexible structure, which is called a groupoid. Um, uh, it's just a name, but it's very intuitive what happens here. This green guy here is the space of gauge fields. Yeah? I have here the points are 
A's, A primes, A prime primes. And now instead of identifying and forming a quotient space, I record the effect of gauge transformations by drawing arrows. Here G is a gauge transformation from A to A prime, and G prime is a different one. Recording arrows, I hence also record uh, uh, self equivalences under gauge transformations. When there is an A prime prime, and the gauge transformation transforming it to itself, I also record that. So this groupoid you should think of as a space, but with arrows attached. Yeah? And these arrows remember the relations between different points coming from gauge symmetries. And the advantage here is, of course, that I don't know, I, I do know more than if two things are gauge equivalent. I know in how many ways are they gauge equivalent, and that's essential information. Now, the issue, when this is now where the homotopy comes from, now if you buy that groupoids are better than quotient spaces, which you should buy because they have this definitely more structure, then you have a slight issue doing standard mathematics. Namely, two groupoids one should consider as being the same, not only when they are isomorphic in the sense of a natural notion of isomorphism here, but also when they are equivalent or weakly equivalent. This means that, so for those who know a bit category theory, so a groupoid is a category with a special property and equivalences of groupoids are equivalences of the category. So this is more than just isomorphism. And so when one works with groupoids, one has to make sure that one does only constructions preserving these weak equivalences. Because when, when I do a construction and I start the construction from something which is the same meaning weakly equivalent, I want to have the same meaning a weakly equivalent outcome. And this is not so easy to do. It sounds like a, a trivial problem dealing with these weak equivalences. It's a hard problem and this required a lot of work initiated by Quillen and which is uh, nowadays called homotopical algebra. This is a non-abelian version of homological algebra. Some of you probably have seen homological algebra, or you can also call that model category theory. These are the same names for a framework which allows you to deal with these, these weak equivalences in a structured way. Now, using this perspective, it tells you exactly what is the non-redundant information in a groupoid. Namely, non-redundant information are two. Information number one, the zero somotopy group of the groupoid, which means here just the gauge orbit space in this example. Number two, the stabilizer group, so the automorphism groups of gauge potentials, those gauge transformations preserving a fixed connection. So the groupoid knows more. The groupoid knows not only the gauge orbit space, but also the stabilizer groups. And these stabilizer groups carry crucial information. I will come back to that. So taking gauge invariant observables was a bad idea because I just see the pi zero and I don't see these pi ones, these stabilizer groups. And so this is kind of then the, the starting point of the developments we do. We want to develop a framework for quantum field theory which sees these pi ones and which makes use to, of them. And it, it, it sounds now crazy, but in, in two or three slides I show you how this relates to something everybody knows. Okay. So um, now, how are these groupoids related to local to global properties? Um, so in contrast, or when you do, when you describe your spaces of gauge fields by groupoids and not by quotient spaces, not by gauge orbit spaces, you have a very strong local to global property, which I just showed briefly, this one. Now let me say what it means. Um, so it's called a homotopy sheaf property. I don't want to go into the details. What this means, it's a kind of precise way of saying what, what we know, namely that gauge fields on M you can describe in a one-to-one -one way by local check data. Yeah? In order to describe the, the gauge fields on M, you can take local gauge fields and transition functions satisfying these conditions, and then you can patch them. Yeah? So you can use local or global descriptions to describe the same thing. And this is a precise way of, of saying what that means. So the crucial point is that when you take groupoids of gauge fields instead of gauge orbit spaces, you have a very strong local to global property inspired by that or similar to that, but precisely said here, which allows you to recover your gauge fields on M from gauge fields in a cover. And this whole limb, this is, this is the 
complicated part, the homotopy limit, this is related to this homotopical algebra business. Okay, um, so using this group or so taking them seriously, we have better chances in getting local to global properties for gauge series. Now, we want to do quantum field series, so we want to need, we, we, we want to have quantized algebras of functions on the space of fields. So in quantum field theory, at least how you construct your simple models, you, you take your space of fields, your space of solutions of say the clan gordon equation, take functions on that and quantize this function algebra, so the classical Poisson algebra you quantize. And this is what one wants to do in quantum field theory, one needs algebras of functions on spaces of fields. Now it's of course clear what happens when I have a space of fields which is a set plus a smooth structure in a certain sense, so I'm not going into the details here. When you have a, a standard space of fields, so a set plus structures, then you know how to take functions. You take functions and then the functions on a space form an algebra, this we know. Functions on a space we can multiply point-wise, we can add, we can, we can do all these things. So this forms an algebra. So when working with normal fields, one gets an algebra of functions. But now I try to convince you that, or I try to explain why spaces of fields in gauge series should be groupoids with smooth structure. And now, of course, the question is when we want to go from this classical picture to a quantum gauge series, we have to say how to take function algebras on groupoids or on smooth groupoids. And so in particular one has to ask, is this function algebra on the group or it's still an algebra or is this something else? Um, now, <coughs> the easiest way to answer this question is, is um, to go a bit further. <laughs> so, uh, to a groupoid, you can kind of unravel this complicated groupoid structure in something more easy to deal with, namely a simplicial set. So for the gauge <laughs> field example, the simplicial set has the following. It has here a bunch of spaces or a bunch of sets and a bunch of arrows between them. And at the lowest level, I have the gauge fields. At the next level, I have the gauge fields and the gauge transformations. Then here I have the gauge fields, gauge transformations, gauge transformations, and so on and so on and so on always more copies of gauge transformations and these arrows they describe how the gauge transformations act and how the gauge transformations compose up here. So this encodes all the structure of gauge fields, gauge transformations and what they do together. Now on this simplicial set it's more intuitively clearer how to take functions on that. Namely here what one can do is one can take level-wise functions, so I take observables here, observables here of this guy, and so on and so on and so on, and taking functions, arrows turn around, yeah? because maps between spaces induce pullbacks between functions. So this is now the opposite way of simplicial, so people call it co-simplicial, and each of these guys is an algebra. So this just kind of, I, want to give, I wanted to give you a pictorial way of, of accepting that function algebras on groupoids are co-simplicial algebras, but you can make these things mathematically precise. For example, in algebraic geometry, in Toen's paper on fine stacks, you see this construction made precise, that it's really a good construction in this framework. And it's intuitively clear, uh, intuitively we do a level-wise, taking functions level-wise, okay? Now, the question is, what does that mean? Have you seen that before? And yes, everybody who has seen the BRST formalism has seen at least some shadows of that. Namely, what we did is kind of, we rediscovered the ghost fields. Um, okay, this is, I have to keep that. Okay, here we had co-simplicial algebras and nowadays a machinery called Dolkan correspondence, I don't want to explain that. You can make out of co-simplicial algebras differential graded algebras. And this now looks like that. When you do that for our co-simplicial algebra of observables for a gauge theory, you get a, co a differential graded algebra, which looks roughly the same. Here these are the same, but now these maps, you take alternating sums and produce differentials in that way. So this is degree zero of the differential graded algebra, this is degree one, degree two, and so on. Now, this is, because of Dolkan is an equivalence, I can describe my functions on the group point of gauge fields similarly, equivalently by that. But now this is, this has some relation to something you have seen. Namely, 
if you are now look here here they are finite gauge transformations but now if you kind of don't care about finite gauge transformation you want to linearize you just want to look at infinitesimal gauge transformations so these are functions with values in the Lie algebra this in linearization or infinitesimalization has a name it's called the Van East map this is uh, a map known from Lie group cohomology and this also works for groupoids. So you take this guy and you kind of linearize it and then it takes this form. So this differential graded algebra we have is a non-infinitesimal version of the gauge field observables times some exterior algebra of that. But these guys are called the ghost fields in physics. So what you see here is that these guys are the ghost fields and the dual here means these are ghost field observables. This is the algebra of ghost field observables and this is the infinitesimal version of these guys. So all these higher orders in the differential graded algebra describe non-infinitesimal analogs of ghost fields. So this is what I told you, even though it goes via uh, some higher geometry, it, 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 has, it reduces when you approximate to, to BRST formalism, you know. Yeah, so it's not so crazy what I'm saying, because when I take stuff infinitesimal, it comes out BSD formalism, which is a good consistency check. And now if you, always, if you ever ask yourself the question, can I do BRST formalism for finite gauge transformations, then the answer is yes, that's the guy. Yeah? So BRST formalism also works for finite gauge transformations. And it, and it has the origin from taking the groupoid picture of gauge field configuration spaces seriously. So these ghost fields are related to these arrows I've drawn before. The ghost fields are these arrows. Okay? Good. Now, <coughs> now let's pack that together and, and, give, and let's give you a very loose definition of the kind of structures I'm looking for. I don't want to give a precise definition, and so intentionally imprecise, because here I will give a precise definition in one line, which however I won't explain too much. Um, so what I want to do is, what we want to do is, we want to describe quantum field series, um, which have this gauge theoretic flavor inside. So, and the first thing what you have to do is, you have to go away from using observable algebras. You need differential graded algebras or other higher algebras to describe your gauge field observables. These are because of the ghosts, yeah? the ghosts are here. Um, now, you again want to look at an assignment of these, algebra, of these DG algebras to space times, but now this assignment doesn't have to be functorial anymore. Here everything gets more flexible, it can be functorial up to homotopy. So this is what I mean here by weak, but I, as I said, intentionally imprecise at the moment. And the axioms I want is, so I want something like a causality axiom, but again, when you look at examples, you will see, oh, I cannot demand that observables in which are space-like separated strictly commute. You have, to, you have to allow for them to commute up to homotopies. So I want these commutators to be not zero, but they are allowed to be coherently homotopic to zero. I also want the time slice axiom, but again, inverting becomes more tricky in that framework. The inverse doesn't need to exist strictly, but just again up to homotopies. Uh, and then I want to have a local to global property. So this is my wish list, what I want. And I said this is intentionally imprecise. Now let's, uh, first of all, what I mean by coherent here, all this data has to be coherent in the following sense. When you now want to commute space-like separated things, for example, then you could, when you have three space-like separated observables, then you can do two ways of commuting them. A, a first a B and C, and then C and A, or C in one step. And these are controlled by different homotopies, and so you want these two ways to be the same up to a higher homotopy. So you see that there's a lot of extra homotopy data happening in this definition. So these higher homotopies is also what makes this definition intentionally imprecise, because it's not so easy to control them. But there is fortunately machinery to control them, and this machinery is called OPRAD theory. And so the precise definition of what that should be is there exists an operat controlling quantum field series. It doesn't matter when you don't know what is an operat, but operat is some algebraic structure which, which describes quantum field series. And 
operats have infinity versions, so you can look at these things up to coherent homotopies, and these are constructive ways how to construct these infinity versions. And now a homotopic in quantum field theory is then one of these infinity algebras plus this universality condition which I addressed here. Okay, so this is the precise definition, but I won't go into the details here. Okay, now uh, some results. What one can check now in that framework? And time-wise, well, it's a bit of time. Okay, so let's, let's see that really on the level of observables, um, the local to global property gets better when we use this technology. So, <coughs> and this is, uh, I, I, before I said that, that you can recover your, your um, magnetic charges or your, mm, or your monopole bundles, you can recover them from local knowledge of no bundles. And this is done here. So, um, let's look at U1 gauge theory for, for the moment on a contractible or on some RM, on some Euclidean space. And so the space of fields or the groupoid of fields, because here everybody is a billion, has a much easier description in terms of a chain complex. And probably you have seen that again. So here sit the gauge fields, here sit the gauge transformations, and this D log and this prefactor here is how gauge transformations act on gauge fields. So this is this chain complex encodes in an equivalent way the data this groupoid encoded. When they can do that because uh, yeah, I'm a billion here, everybody's a billion. Now, this is the chain complex model of the space of gauge fields on M. Now, I can take observables on that chain complex by taking level-wise observables. So, when I take observables, so I take just now exponential observables, so linear observables, exponentiated observables. So, taking exponential functions on here, you see that this is the same as taking m minus 1 forms, m is the dimension, compactly supported, because these forms I can integrate against that. So this, this is why I call that observable. Because what is an observable? An observable is something like which assigns to a gauge field a number. And I can do that by integrating the one form against against the compactly supported m minus 1 form. Okay, so I mean these kind of observables, or better say they're exponentials. Now, similar observables on here on the space of circle valued functions are top forms satisfying some integrality condition, which I don't want to explain. So this is now the chain complex of observables, and the question is, can I recover the global observables, so you see, this doesn't know about bundles and, and so on. It doesn't know about non-trivial bundles, because it's on a trivial guy, on a trivial space-time. And the question is, can I, via this Friedenhagen type extension construction, can I obtain a reasonable amount of global observables from these local observables here? And this is the formula, it's some homotopy co-limit co over that, it's uh, not so important, this formula. And the statement is, yes, you can. So, when you take these observables you know on, 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 on uh, diamonds, and you perform this extension prescription, then on diamonds you don't get new stuff, which is good. So, because these are reasonably many observables on diamonds. However, when you take a generic M, then these observables you get via this local to global construction are equivalent to the dual of the delinear complex. What means is the delinear complex is what classifies U1 bundles with connections. So I get enough observables to distinguish um, U1 bundles with connections. So I have observables measuring bundles. So the magnetic charges popped up in this construction. So this is very nice. And that's much better than the traditional Friedenhagen construction, which doesn't have this homotopical component, because when you do that for a billion gauge theory, you get the wrong algebra of observables. So this is one kind of application you can do. To, to really check that, that if, you just, if you just would know gauge theory locally, the machine would tell you what it does globally on non-trivial space times. Okay? Now, toy models. So I think this is also the last thing I will say today. Um, so I was 
we were interested in, so this was not yet quantized. So see, this is classical observer vision, just, just uh, a very, very simple toy model. And now let's look at a bit more complicated toy models. So can we construct toy models of this homotopical quantum field theory framework? And yeah, with Benini, I, we cooked up a nice construction, which I also has a physical interpretation, which I will tell you while going. Okay, so imagine we now have a quantum field theory on space times with extra structure. So imagine you want to say describe Dirac fields and then you, you, you play around and, and put spin structures on your space times and on these sp spin manifolds you then uh, assign the algebras of the Dirac field. So it's very natural when you that, that sometimes people look at quantum field series which are defined on space times with extra structures. And so this SDR is now the category of space times with extra structures. Technically, it's a category fiber than groupoids over space times. Now, here, there again, the groupoids happening. Namely, over each space time sits a groupoid, namely the groupoid of extra structure. For example, when I would take here spin manifolds, then over each space time sits the groupoid of all spin structures. Okay? And now, what we wanted to do is we Okay, first of all, this is now a traditional quantum field theory, say a Dirac quantum field theory. Um, now we want to regard this as a trivial homotopical quantum field theory, which we can do because algebras are differential graded algebras automatically. And then I want to do something which you can understand as integrating out these, these, these degrees of freedom, these group or degrees of freedom, integrating out the extra structures, which is done here by a homotopy can extension okay uh, okay so this theory here oh sorry this theory here the dashed one is the one which I want because this is the is described as the theory which which it's not really integrating out it's the wrong word to say it's the theory which takes these groupoids of extra structures and promotes them to observables okay uh, I say it in a second more clear. Um, here I said it, the, turns the background gauge field, so here we have background fields, namely the extra structure on M, and these background gauge fields are turned into observables by this construction. So this construction produces a quantum field theory which has quantized meta fields and background gauge fields. So this is the kind of, this is why I say toy model, because these gauge fields here in these group points they are not quantized by this construction. But this is so, so a hybrid theory having quantized meta and, and classical gauge. And these are the theories we wanted to construct. Now, you can do that. And the uh, algebras you get, or the differential graded algebras you get, have nice interpretations as combinations of classical and classical gauge field observers and quantum meta field observers. So the calculation indeed shows that the idea of producing this hybrid theory, classical, gauge quantum meta works and the statement is that when your category fiber in group board has some property which is like a flappiness property um, then this homotopy right kind extension produces a homotopical locally covariant quantum field theory where these coherences I was talking about are just satisfied in low degrees Okay, and this is now the first toy models for this, the first toy models we could produce for these new axioms. Um, what is hard is to check these local to global conditions because uh, this technology one needs is, is quite difficult, these, these, these local to global extensions for differential graded algebras. Now, this is, this I want to skip because I think I did already long enough. So another stuff, I quickly say it in words what we did here. So, so now as a preparation for discussing dynamical gauge theories and quantizing them, we wanted to understand better the smooth structure on these groupoids of Young-Mills fields. So the smooth groupoids are called stacks, and so what we did is we studied the stack of non-abelian Young-Mills fields in a bit more detail. So I don't want to go through that. Um, this takes too long. Then. You also have a nice statement about what this means the Cauchy problem in that framework, but okay. So let me let me quickly sum up. Okay, um, so I hope so. Th I think this was the main message. So let me let me quickly 
concentrate and, and let me think what I want to say. So I think the main message, I know, I know it, it's a bit chaotic because it's, um, it's, it's not easy to speak about these things and it's probably also not easy to listen about these things. But the main message I wanted to bring across is that quantum gauge series do not fit into this framework of algebraic quantum field theory and algebraic quantum field theory and curved space time. So they do not fit and not for some stupid reason but for some important reason, namely Classical gauge series have crucial homotopical features. These arrows I draw, these gauge transformations, they are extra structure. You shouldn't quotient them out. They are important extra structure. And when you do normal quantum field theory with observable algebras, you are losing these crucial properties, these cu crucial structures. And so one needs a sort of higher algebra, differential graded or co simplicial algebras, in order to formalize quantum gauge series. And this is exactly what we are trying to address in this line of research homotopical AQFT. Now what we obtained is a bunch of results, namely we wanted to do that in order to have better local to global properties and yes indeed it works. Local to global properties in gauge series get better once you do it homotopical and that is also clear why gauge fields Gauge equivalence classes do not glue together. You cannot take gauge equivalence classes and glue them together. You have to take gauge fields and transition functions to glue them. And this, when you understand that, that you cannot glue gauge equivalence classes, but you have to glue gauge fields and transition functions, you know why these homotopical features are important. And the same holds true in quantum fields. Now, the, you can construct a bunch of toy models via some abstract nonsense construction which produces you um, kind of hybrid models which have quantized meta fields and classical gauge fields combined into these higher algebras so these work pretty well and as a preparation towards understanding the Poisson geometry and deformation quantization of young mill theory we are we worked out the young mill stack and studied what means to have a Cauchy problem in this higher geometric context. Now, um, on the algebraic side, um, all these, you, you cannot, this homotopical locally covariant quantum field theory, you cannot do any more brute force. You need machinery in order to control coherences. And that's not funny. Coherences, when you have, when you have like, 12 coherences, it's fine, you do it by hand, but here you have infinitely many coherences, this you cannot do by hand. You need machinery to control these things, and this machinery we developed in this paper here, and this goes to, and this is related to operats. Now, of course, um, what I want to do is the next years or so, I want to see to have some more proper examples of dynamically and quantized gauge series in that framework, of course, starting again with the billion examples and then it is also a bit unclear what is the physics behind these higher algebras because it's a it's a question which in principle people should have thought about but I don't know what people think about that because um, the question is so something like are ghost fields physical and what I'm telling you is, is I think yes but what <laughs> probably everybody else thinks no but I think gauge fields are physical for a specific reason which I for now keep for myself unless somebody asks. Okay, thanks. Okay, one very general question. How do you classify this stuff? Is this physics or is this mathematics motivated by physics? Mathematics motivated by physics, yeah. That is, um, homotopy theory is a quite young field and it just starts in the last a few years to, to enter mathematical physics and and it it is it is relevant because you, you recover from a good understanding, you recover as shadows stuff people did, BRST formalism, B V formalism, all these things have a deeper meaning. And so this is important to study these things in my opinion. Because physical recipes are new and good mathematical structures in that framework and that is quite nice. So this is what attracts me in this field. Because I, 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 I back then I studied physics and I've seen the ghost fields and the BV and so on, but it never made sense. And now it starts making sense, these things, you know. Jo? 
Yeah, regarding these cost bits, did we know that you could do this BRC transformation um, non infinite like finite BRC transformation? Did, did we know we could do that before this, or we uh, learned it from, from this? So I, um, I think in I was googling for finite BRC transformations um, because um, when I've seen that at some point I thought people must have seen that. But um, there is in the literature people call finite BRC transformations something different. It's not that thing I'm talking about. So I think in this form, um, it of course of course it follows from stuff people people in some other branch knew because in in in, in uh, uh, Lee group point cohomology people had these techniques but they never thought about ghost fields so when you translate what they know into the mathematical physics problems then you see these things as, as non infinitesimal gauge fields and i think these were not really well understood and and, and it's also harder to work with them because this is this is not anymore such a simple differential graded algebra like for the infinitesimal ghost fields. There are already these coherences and higher homotopies come, and these are much harder to work with, unfortunately. So I'm not sure how practically good this is at the moment, but theoretically, definitely good when you have BST for finite gauge transformation because finite gauge transformations are important. When you don't do finite gauge transformations, your Aharon of Bohm phase is a line. So it's, it physics tells you finite gauge transformations are important. Is there any expectation? Is there any expectation that uh, you know, by by uh, placing essentially one of the in curve space time in that framework, you will be able to address some problems with quantum field theory in curve space time, like you know, the cosmological constant problem? Or oh no, the quantum field theory in curved space times can never address the cosmological constant problem. Because um, how quantum field theory and curved space times is done is, is, is via renormalization. You have to renormalize your stress energy tensor and so on. So you cannot give answers to that. They're, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're in this framework, there is no cosmological constant problem because it's just fixing a number. Uh, no, no, I mean, yeah, I'm talking about the large radiant connections yeah. to cosmological no, I problem, think this that you can put <coughs> a different footing by understanding no. how to do At some point you, you have to ask Rainer Feich. Rainer Feich always likes to speak about that because it's a, in, in, the, in such a framework of quantum fields and curved space times, according to Rainer, I'm not physically so good, but um, according to Rainer, you cannot address this question. It's, it's nonsense to ask the question about the value of the cosmological constant because the framework has some domain of applicability where you cannot ask this question because this cons this value of the cosmological constant is a free parameter which enters uh, uh, that the value yes but the, but the radiative corrections are not I mean you can you can take a value and then say okay is that value stable to radiative corrections and and, and that's how you should be posing the question right <coughs> and, yeah. the, and, and by formulating your quantum field theory in a certain way perhaps you can get some insight I mean part of the problem is the fact that you know the estimates we have for all this stuff are based on essentially quantum computing flat space. Right? Ah, you mean, okay, yeah, but then, but then, um, then you don't have to use this homotopical business because when you are just interested in, say, scalar fields in cosmological space times, then there are perturbative techniques which are, which are... Yeah, but, not I'm, not, but, yeah, but I'm not interested in scalar fields in specific. I'm just saying that perhaps by, by looking, Perhaps the intuition we get by considering scalar fields in, in curved space time is wrong, exactly mm -hmm. because we're not, you know, we're not getting the full picture by seeing scalar fields and by, by looking at what you're doing. Yeah, you know, I don't you know. Get some deeper intuition about how you should be doing quantum field theory in curved space time and how you should cal calculate things. Yeah. yeah. How to calculate things? Yeah, it's always the question. How to calculate things? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm more. I don't know how much practical value this is what I'm doing because um, I'm doing that because I want to. I, I have a simple question: What is a gauge theory, and why is it different to something which is not a gauge theory? And and if I give you a quantum field theory written in a strange way, can you tell me if it's a gauge theory or not? So these kind of questions are the ones which are of interest to me. And what about gravity? I mean, so so I mean, your 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 causality and time slicing conditions seem to imply that your framework will never be able to include gravity. Ah, yeah. Um, so, but uh, uh, Frednagen and Kasha Reitzner, they are looking at perturbative 
gravity and, and this works quite well and, and it is better than standard perturbation theory in gravity because what you're doing is you have a kind of infinitesimal version of background independence because remember a theory is a functor from space times to algebra say now what they're doing is now these space times describe now the background metrics in a sense and then they allow fluctuations on them yeah, so they quantize the stuff which sits on top of them. But now what you can do is you can you can make changes in the background metric and you because you work here on all on all space times at the same time. So you can ask yourself when I take a bit of the classical part and I shift it to the quantum part, does the theory change? These are then allowed questions and such kind of infinitesimal perturbative versions of background independence they can make. So it's a bit useful for perturbative yeah. quantum gravity. Uh, you have a better a better thing than taking a fixed space time and doing perturbative gravity on that, but it's of course far away from full quantum gravity where where this guy there is no space time, so this should be a point yeah, so but this, the, the, this is the quantum gravity needs needs other techniques.